chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, living for God. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse upon you but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regards to the spirit. Good morning, Avenue. It's good to be with you today. Uh, it's really good to be looking at God's word with you today. Uh, I want to begin this morning with a true story of a lady called Florence Chadwick. Now she was the first woman ever to swim the English Channel and back and she decided that she wanted to be the first woman to swim the 26 mile stretch of the Pacific Ocean called the Catalina Channel. So on a cold foggy day in 1952 she stepped into the ocean and she began to swim. Behind her in some rowing boats there was a mum who was there to just shout encouragements along the way and there were some other men with guns who were there to shoot sharks and that's about it. And so she swam, mile after mile, hour after hour, stroke after stroke through ice cold, shark infested water surrounded by fog. After about 15 hours of swimming, exhausted, she cried out to the nearest boat to be pulled in. She just couldn't do it anymore. But her mum happened to be in that boat and her mum called out to her, keep going, don't quit, you're almost there. And so Florence carried on swimming for a bit. An hour later though, the fog got so thick that Florence couldn't see anything at all. And she called out again, she was dragged into the nearest boat and she gave up, exhausted. But when she got into that boat, she was told that she was less than a mile away from the shore. Less than a mile. Oh, she said at the press conference the next day, all I could see was fog. I think if I could have just seen the shore, I would have made it. So close, and yet, so far, it all got too hard and she just gave up at just the wrong time. Stories like that are heartbreaking, aren't they? People getting so close to their end point, to the victory, the thing they're aiming for, and then missing out on that. That's why films like Cool Running stick out in our brains so much. I couldn't think of any more modern versions of that, maybe documentaries or films. If you've got any, please tell me. I'd love to have some more modern references. But I think stories like that are even more heartbreaking when they're in the Christian life, aren't they? Like the Christian life we know is a long distance race, often through fog and cold and hurt. And I'm sure plenty of us know people who found it too hard and who've given up. People who found the fight against sin and resisting temptation just too difficult. People who found the pressure on them from the world around to be just like them, to be too attractive. Who found the call to self-denial and taking up their cross daily too difficult. Who found the countercultural beliefs of the Bible too alienating. And who found the challenge of suffering for the sake of obeying Jesus just too much of an obstacle. And who gave up. Who turned their back on Christ and Christianity. And who walk away. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? And it's maybe particularly heartbreaking for many of us because we know and feel and have felt that temptation to give up. If we're honest, we don't know how long we could keep going if our circumstances are any different to what they are like now. Maybe you're feeling something of that right now. How can I possibly keep going? Maybe this lockdown and the pressures that have come with it of homeschooling or working from home or both are just too exhausting. Maybe the death that seemingly seems to be all around us is eating at us far more than we expected it to be. Maybe it's not COVID related things. Maybe your marriages are struggling. Maybe parenting is really, really tiring. Maybe your relationship is not what you wish it was. Maybe you don't have the relationship you wish you had. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's money struggles. Whatever it may be, 
maybe it's all just getting too hard. Maybe the diagnosis has come. And all you want to do is just let loose. But being a Christian is stopping you from doing that in the way that you really want to. You see, for so many people, there's always just that temptation to just give up on God. And even if not altogether, for a bit. Just so we can do that thing. Feel that pleasure. Experience that, whatever it is, for a little bit. You see, the Christian life is hard. If you're not a Christian watching this, and you've been given the impression that being a Christian is just one long conga line dancing happily to the grave, then I need to tell you that's not the case at all. The Christian life is hard. The water we swim in is ice cold and surrounded by sharks who are attacking us. And the fog is thick, so thick it's hard to see where we're going a lot of the time. And the temptation to give up is constant. So how do we keep going? How are we meant to keep going in this Christian life? How do we keep fighting sin when being tempted by it is just so hard? How are we meant to keep living for Jesus in a world that hated him and is therefore going to hate us if we try and live for him? Well, I think in 1 Peter, in the section we're in the middle of, Peter's trying to encourage the churches he's writing to and the Christians in them to do just that. Keep going keep going don't give in to temptation don't give in to the temptation that you can have an easier life by sacking off following jesus even if that's only briefly these christians he's writing to are about to face even worse suffering than they currently are but he tells them keep going and in these verses peter wants to encourage his readers to be willing to suffer and remain faithful to god if and when we're called to in fact Peter wants to get us ready for this fight. He says in verse 1, Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. We're to arm ourselves with this attitude. We're to prepare ourselves with this attitude now. This is something we need to equip ourselves with. Then we're not going to be taken by surprise when the suffering comes and we'll be prepared for what's coming. So start thinking about it now. Even if you're watching this and you're not suffering right now, get ready to. Because the truth is, all you have to do as a Christian to suffer is live long enough. So start thinking this way today. Be prepared. Arm yourself now. And then Peter gives five encouragements in these verses we're going to look at to help us remember and to think about in advance to prepare ourselves when we're faced with suffering of whatever kind. Five reasons to keep living for Christ and to not compromise and to give in or walk away from him. Five truths to prepare ourselves with now to arm ourselves with now to help us be ready when the time comes that we're called to suffer at all for the sake of living for Jesus. So we're going to see those five things now. And firstly, he says, decide now to be willing to suffer for the sake of righteousness because, verse 1, Christ suffered. Christ suffered. Our Saviour suffered. In fact, our Saviour chose to suffer. Suffering didn't just happen to him no jesus chose it jesus the creator of the universe the sustainer of all things the savior of the world of the world the perfectly innocent one the son of god chose to come to earth and live a life of suffering a man of sorrows the bible calls it him and he calls us to take up our cross and follow him so we need to choose to be willing to suffer too you see, to become a Christian is to become a fellow sufferer with Christ. We don't want to claim anything different. And yet the comfort in all of that is Jesus knows what it's like. Our Saviour knows what it's like. He knows more than anyone how hard it is to resist sin. He knows more than anyone how hard it is to be persecuted and attacked for trusting in the Father. He knows what it means to miss out on enjoyable things for the sake of obeying God. And he knows what it means to suffer for it. Trusting and obeying God cost Jesus his family, his friends, and ultimately his life. It led him to sweat drops of blood in his anxiety and his emotional pain. Our saviour knows what it means to suffer. And yet he never sinned. You see, he went through all of that. Why? For us. 
for you and me to save us to win us back to God to win you back to God it was our helplessness and his love for us that drew him to go through all of that because he loves us so much you see our savior suffered and as a result of that the writer of hebrews says we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin you see we can keep going through suffering and not give in to sin because jesus did it for us for you and for me and he promises to be with us when we suffer for him and he promises that we can turn to him at any point in any of our pain in any way and he'll deal with us gently and lovingly and patiently because he knows what it's like our savior suffered so we need to choose to be ready to suffer if we're called to but the second reason peter gives us to choose now to suffer for the sake of righteousness is secondly to show that we've died to sin to show that we have died to sin that's in the rest of verse one and verse two verse one whoever suffers in this body is done with sin as a result they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires but rather for the will of god now in truth i'm not 100 percent sure what all this means but i think what this means is that if we trust god enough to be willing to choose to suffer if living for him calls for it then we're demonstrating to ourselves to our church and to our world around that we really have made a decisive break with sin that we're done with sin and i think being done with sin means being finished with the desire that all of us have to be god and that, that's essentially what sin is isn't it saying to god i don't want you as god i want to be my own god that's what adam and eve wanted they saw that the fruit would make them like god equal with god and so choosing to suffer in our obedience to god proves that we no longer want to be our own god and we choose to trust god to be god so i think in other words peter saying choose to suffer to obey god decide now that you're willing to do that whatever the cost because if you don't the alternative is you'll choose sin you'll choose compromise you'll choose giving in in some way you see choosing to suffer for righteousness sake proves that our bondage our slavery to sin to self-comfort to self-rule has been broken we're done with that see we need to choose to believe now that Jesus Christ and obeying him is worth suffering for and then we need to live that out when the choice comes between either suffering even if that's only denying ourselves short-term pain or short-term pleasure sorry or sinning you see when we get to the point where we'd rather suffer to obey God and fight sin that shows we're done with sin that doesn't mean we're perfect we'll make mistakes we'll compromise we'll give in all the time but choosing to suffer rather than sin shows that we want to run away from sin and run to our savior which i think is why verse 2 says what it says so when we suffer for obeying god it's a sign that we've decided to not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance as it says in chapter one that shows that we're not living to satisfy our sinful human desires and instead we've embraced the will of god for our lives to live holy lives and we think that's far more important so for the sake of righteousness and for the sake of freedom from sin choose now to endure suffering whatever the cost rather than sin in any way because that shows we're done with sin but peter moves on to encourage us to decide now to be willing to suffer if living faithfully for god calls for it because thirdly we've already sinned enough we've already sinned enough that's verses three and four i mean that's a fairly simple statement isn't it verse three for you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do so don't do it anymore suffer if you have to and be ready for it but don't sin anymore you see any amount of sin we've done in the past is enough so if we've sinned only a little before we were converted or even since that's enough 
And if we've sinned loads and loads for years and years before now, that's enough to stop. See, as Christians, we shouldn't ever say, oh, I need a bit more time to sin. But do you ever have those kind of thoughts? Where you wish you weren't stopped from doing certain things because you're a Christian. Maybe that's drinking, drugs, sleeping around, lying, stealing, whatever it is. Well, Peter says, choose now to fight that temptation. Because you've done enough sin already. You see, Peter wants to remind ourselves that the time we've spent sinning is enough. Make the break. Choose the will of God rather than sin. And choose to suffer for it and deny ourselves for it if we have to. And verse 4 tells us that people will mock us for it. So if we're not joining in with the things that they do, they're going to heap abuse on us. They're going to make us look and perhaps feel stupid and like we're missing out. We'll see a bit more of that in a minute. But we need to prepare ourselves for that and prepare ourselves to not give in to temp temptation to compromise just this once. We've spent enough time in the past sinning. So don't compromise now. We've already sinned enough. But Peter doesn't stop there. He goes on to give us another encouragement to decide to be willing to suffer for the sake of righteousness. And fourthly, he says that is because God is just. God is just. That's in verse 5. You see, when we suffer for righteousness sake, we don't need to resort to sinful vengeance. Like Peter said in chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. We don't need to have the last word or the last silent angry look. Because our Father in heaven will settle all arguments and injustices far better than we ever could. Verse 5. But they, meaning those who heap abuse on you, will have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. You see, when we suffer for obeying God, there's a bit of us that wants to scream out about how unjust we're being treated. And how unfair it is that we're being treated this way. And we want to call the other person to account. And we want to get some justice for it, don't we? And there may well be times when that is right to do. I want to be clear on this. Illegal behaviour and abusive behaviour should always be dealt with when it is possible. And dealt with properly when it is possible. So I don't think this is ever saying that we should never pursue justice. But, thankfully situations like that are relatively rare aren't they if we're honest most of the time the ways that we suffer for righteousness's sake are relatively small and so what peter's saying here is that god wants us to trust the situation and the injustice of all that to him and he always judges justly you see we all want justice to be done when we're wronged in any way by anyone we want justice i'm sure you're having times in your life where you even maybe think back now and think, oh, I wish people knew the truth. And as I've said, there may well be situations where some form of justice can happen here and now. But sadly, in this world, there may well be situations where that can't or won't happen too. And so Peter wants to remind these Christians who are about to be abused and persecuted intensely by the powers of the day. That the people who are going to talk to them will one day stand before God. And will one day give an account to him. Nothing's going to be swept under the rug. Nothing's going to be forgotten. And the judge will be God. And in case we think that death might rescue a person from this judgment. Peter says God's ready to judge the living and the dead. At death is no escape. I'm sure that is a huge comfort to Peter's readers in the years to come. I'm sure Holocaust survivors and victims of abusers who've died find huge comfort in that fact Hebrews 9 verse 27 says that people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment you see death may have come to many people after a long and comfortable life of sin but after it comes judgment before the all remembering all seeing perfect holy and just God so if you're not a Christian and you're watching this now, and I want you to listen to this bit really clearly and really uh, intensely, because this is the most important thing that you can hear from this sermon. You see, God is not a God who can and will just sweep sin under the rug. And it may seem like you can get away with whatever it is you're doing, whether that is huge sins or relatively small sins, or that you can get away with rejecting God 
and you can get away with wanting God to not be a part of your life and wanting to rule your own life and there's going to be no consequences but I need to tell you that the Bible makes it clear that that are consequences even if they don't happen in this life because one day you'll die and when you do you'll stand before the perfect holy God who created you and who's given you plenty of chances to come to him and be forgiven and you'll be called to account by him and you won't have a leg to stand on if you haven't asked him to forgive you and if you haven't asked him to be lord of your life it'll be too late and the bible says you will receive the punishment you deserve from this same just holy god but there's hope there is hope look back at chapter 3 verse 8 the verse we looked at a couple of weeks ago for christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to god you see this jesus the one you might laugh at or the one you might mock people for believing even if that's in your heart he died and on the cross he took the punishment in your place him the righteous in the place of you and me the unrighteous so that we can be brought back to god brought back into relationship with him so that we can have all of our debt of sin paid for by jesus on the cross instead of having to pay it back ourselves in eternity see justice either happens for you at the cross or it happens to you when you meet god face to face and no matter what you've done in the past or what you even may be doing now jesus christ suffered on the cross so that you can be forgiven of it now so what are you going to do about that don't put off thinking that you can deal with that another time in the future don't put this off until another time when you've sinned a bit more no you've sinned enough get this sorted today you don't know which today is going to be your last one and then it'll be too late so come to this god and he will forgive you ask him to forgive you and make him lord of your life and you can know this justice shown through mercy towards you and forgiveness of sins because jesus will take the punishment the righteous for the unrighteous in your place to bring you back to god but for those of us who are christians when we do suffer wrongly and we feel that someone gets away with murder maybe even literally peter calls us to leave it in the hands of god he will judge the living and the dead so we need to decide and choose to believe here and now that it is better to suffer for doing right rather than getting revenge and to leave judgment and justice to God. God is just and we can trust that. But the final encouragement that Peter gives us to remember now to help us fight against the temptation to compromise and to sin in the future, the final encouragement he gives us for that is this we will triumph over death that's in verse six now again verse six i think is fairly difficult to understand but if i've got it right i think it's talking about people who've heard the gospel and then died so it's not people who heard the gospel after they died because as we've already said that's too late but people who've heard the gospel and then died and so they then live again in the spirit with christ so i think it says for this reason saving people from judgment is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead they weren't dead when they heard the gospel they were alive when they heard the gospel but they've now died so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body but live according to god in regard to the spirit so i think the point of this verse is to encourage us that even though there is a judgment coming beyond the grave and even though all of us die those who hear and believe and trust in the gospel will live according to god in regard to the spirit you see it may well be that one of the ways people were abusing the christians and mocking the christians peter was writing to was by saying ha you think you got such good news you say that you're going to escape judgment well you still die and if you die and you don't have any fun and we die and we get all the fun we end up in the same place so i say eat drink and be merry because tomorrow we die but peter's encouragement against this is to remember that the gospel wasn't preached to our dead Christian friends in vain. The reason the gospel was preached to those who've died is so that even though it might look like they've been judged like everybody else with the same end as everybody else, 
we know by faith they haven't. They are now, even now, alive in the spirit. They're with the Lord. And the sufferings that they experience here and now are not even worth comparing to the glory that has been revealed to them with the Lord. And that's true for us. You see, no matter what we're called to give up and suffer for the sake of living for God in this life, even if that means giving up our lives, it is entirely worth it. It's not pointless. This life is a brief sneeze of time compared to eternity, and any pain we endure in this life will not even be worth comparing to the glory that we will know and experience when we see God face to face. You see, we need to keep our mind's eye fixed on the shoreline that is ahead, even if we can't see it, and we have to keep swimming, even if it hurts. So we need to remind each other of how glorious that shoreline really is, of all the swimmers who've gone there before us and how worth it it will be when we finally get there, especially when the swim is painful. You see, earth has got no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So let's keep focused on that and remembering that. We triumph over death, even when we have to go through it. So Peter says, choose to remember that now and delight in that now to help us keep swimming when it is particularly tough. You see, Peter's urging us to suffer for righteousness sake, if that is what God calls us to do. And in big or small ways, that is what God calls us to do. And so he encourages us to decide now to be willing to suffer now so that when it happens to us, we're ready. We need to decide to do it because Jesus Christ, our saviour, did it for us. And we do it because enduring suffering shows that we're done with sin because we've already sinned enough. We don't need any more. And because God is a just God and because as Christians, we've already got victory over death guaranteed to us even when we die, we can keep going. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. I've said this many times before. If you're a Christian, this life is as bad as it gets. Ahead is only way better. But I've also said it before that if you're not a Christian, this life's as good as it gets. Ahead is only much worse. So come to this one who can give you this life everlasting that begins even now. Let's follow him this week as a church, wherever he leads and whatever it costs us. Just two months after Florence Chadwick swam her failed swim, she did it again. And this time it was just as cold, it was just as foggy, just as many sharks in the water as before. But this time she made it. And when they asked her afterwards what made the difference, she said, this time, the entire time, I kept in my mind an image of the shore. Heaven is coming. And it is more than worth it, no matter how hard you find it now. So let's keep swimming. Because the shore is just ahead.